So I want to talk to you about uh, a presentation that I gave not too long ago, I guess it was um, maybe a year and a half ago, to 60 commercial real estate brokers. And so when I, I always like to ask folks when they're coming in, why are you here? What do you want to walk away with? And so the, <laughs> this real estate agent just kind of smiled, he had his arms folded, smiled, looked at me and says, you had me at capital gains taxes or voluntary. And so I said, oh, can I use that? I like that. So that's the name of our tackle. But not only are capital gains taxes voluntary, let's understand why that is. How many people have ever been told that, that capital gains taxes are voluntary? So unless you sat with us, you probably haven't, but you'll understand why. So my goals for today are twofold. Number one, I just want to give you an, a quick overview of some different alternatives. So if you're a real estate professional, or if you're someone who's going to be selling your business, or if you're an advisor to those that are selling your business or real estate, I want to share with you some ideas about some alternatives that will keep you from paying tax, okay? And why that is, and do some good things as well. And I also want to be able to provide you as an additional resource. So I get calls all the time from CPAs and bankers and other professional advisors saying, RJ, I can't tell you who this is for yet, but I've got a client who's selling their company, or I've got a client right now, we're just closing today thanks to Brian's brilliant work, and I got to contribute a little bit to this as well, but we're selling about four and a half million dollars of dirt out in El Centro, California. Um, some of it is taxable, but some of it is not. They thought they were gonna pay tax on the whole thing. We were able to come in fortunately at the last minute and save them from having to pay a bunch of tax. But I wanna be able to give you some resources as well about what you can do if, you, if you're in that situation. How can you sell and not pay tax? So whether you're selling business, real estate, or other appreciated assets, what do you do? So, now, I'm going to invite you to ride with me a little bit on this winding road because I want, to give, I want to step back before we can drill into some reasons why capital gains taxes are voluntary, along with some other things. So, most wealthy affluent Americans understand that we have an obligation to support the social well-being of our country. And you know what? I've been all around the world, and it, it, America, for all its faults, um, is a pretty cool place to be. There's no other country I'd rather live in. But what most wealthy, affluent Americans don't understand is that the government gives us a choice in how we support the social well-being of our country. Now, if we don't choose in advance, they choose for us. And what's that called? Taxes. Exactly right. It's called taxes. But if we choose in advance how we want to support our social well-being of our country, capital gains taxes are, in fact, voluntary. But not only that, federal estate taxes or federal death taxes, or even if the knuckleheads up in Sacramento put through this estate tax in California in 2020, that will be voluntary if we do something else. The 3.8% Medicare surtax is also voluntary. Do you see a, a theme going here? Are you kind of getting the trend of it? All right, so, but it's, they're all voluntary if you do something very specific. And that is if you choose in advance how you want to support the social well-being of our country. And if you choose in advance, you can opt out of those taxes. So that's what I want to talk to you about is how you can, first of all, identify with the things that are important to your own value system. And if you do that, then there are opportunities in which you can opt out. So let me, again, give you just a quick 30,000 foot view. In the mid-60s, there was a number of things that were fomenting up. Americans, as a country, have always been the most generous of any country in history. And so there was a tremendous move, and so they came up with the Tax Reform Act of 1969. So that's been 50 years that this has been in the tax code. And yet, if you go to talk with most CPAs, most tax attorneys, and other professional advisors, they don't know at all about this particular tax act. And yet it brought us a number of different things, what we call split interest gifts, meaning that it's okay to do something that's good for you as long as you do something good for your community, your city, your school your church, either now, in the future, or both. So split interest. So for example, charitable major trust is one that many people may have heard of. But there's also something called charitable lead trust, which is just the inverse. It's where you give money to a not-for-profit for a period of time, and at the end of that period of time, either the money comes back to you, or it goes to your kids or nieces, nephews, whatever. Um, charitable gift annuities. Jim and I were talking about that earlier. And uh, Jim does quite a bit of work in this area. That's where you can have, as a, as a particularly if you're 70, 75, 80, 85 uh, in, in age, you can take maybe $100,000 out of it that you had in a CD, put it into a charitable gift annuity. You'll get an income stream of 5, 6, even 7%. 
but at the same time, you also get a deduction of roughly $50,000. So you can do something that's good for you and at the same time, good for a charity. But that's a charitable gift annuity, life estate agreements. Uh, it's where you can live in a home for the rest of your life and then at your death, that home goes to Scripps or Salk or Sharp. But in the meantime, you get a 50% income tax deduction. So depending on what your age is. So a lot of cool things that were created out of that tax act that nobody knows about. But there, for those of us that are planning in that area, there's some great things that can be done. So hold on to those thoughts. If we're willing to support the social well-being of our country in a way that's in our uh, alignment with our own value system, there's some remarkable things that can be done. Like what, you might ask? Well, like forgiving taxes. Because in California, if you sell an appreciated asset, how much are the taxes? It's 20% in most cases federal long-term capital gain. But in addition to that, it's 14.63% in California and a 3.8% Medicare surtax. So if you're selling an asset that's appreciated, if you don't do some of the things I'm going to suggest to you, be prepared to open your wallet or your purse up big because you're going to pay a lot in taxes if you don't plan ahead. And that's why people come to see us. So we're, let's how many people want to hear what I got now what's coming up? <laughs> okay, I should see every hand in the room up. I'm, what? Come on here. It's just, I know it's just after lunchtime. So, but how, yeah, thank you. Very good. Thank you, Lori. I see that. I see that hand calling on you. Uh, so let me walk you through three actual case studies. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Delaware Stat Statutory Trust, the, what I call the easy uh, 1031, a capital gains alternative trust, and also uh, the newest one. Um, and again, you won't find these names. In, if you Google them, you're not going to find these names. These are my own names, Tax Deferred Installment Sale, which we're just finishing today. I think, I think, Brian, I think Brian, it is, the dust is settling, right, on this one. Oh, please, please, God, we've been working on this one for a while. So let's start with case number one, the, the good DST, or what I call the easy 1031. How many people have ever done a 1031 exchange? I see Tom, yeah, okay, great. I have as well. You know, I, I, I'm an eight-time marathoner, so I haven't, that's, to some, that's a lot. To, to some, that's not at all. I mean, Brian's run more than that. But, uh, you know, they say with running a marathon, it's like hitting your head with a hammer. It feels good when you stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, same thing is true. When you, do a defer, when you go through and do a 1031 exchange, it's like, oh, good. We're finally done with that. It's painful. Well, one of the reasons it's painful is because the government puts so many restrictions on it. You have to identify the replacement properties that you're going to do within a 45-day period. And if you don't, you fail the 1031 test and you pay taxes. And if you don't get everything to settle within 12, six months, you still fail. So this is a way that you can kind of sneak in the back door and qualify for that 1031 is by using a Delaware statutory trust. Now note, it's not a deferred sales trust. That's the other DST. That's the bad one. There's like two kinds of cholesterol. There's the HDL, that's the good one. And then there's the bad one, the LDL. That's the D, that other DST. So if somebody starts talking about deferred sales trust, don't just walk, run to get away from that one. All right? So again, it helps you to get through that 45-day qualification. But what it does is it, um, right now, we've got projects and properties that are in the 6 to 9% range. So I'm working with a, a case over in Coronado. And... Uh, <laughs> Some people have seen this one and they go, gosh, I feel so sorry for this woman not. Um, because she has been getting $40,000 a month. Her, her husband happened to be really a brilliant real estate developer. Um, and we're able, he was able to buy uh, some property up in Oakland. Who would have ever thought that Oakland would actually be a great place to own real estate? But OK, go figure. That's, this is America. Great things happen in the most un uh, unexpected ways. So her income has been $40,000 a month, all taxable. But what we've been able to do now is instead put her into another project where her income stream, and she had her choices, between $650,000 and $900,000. You might say, well, why wouldn't you take the $900,000? Because there's nothing else on the back end. It's just basically, it's actually through the University of New Mexico, and they're offering these bonds for the next five years at 9%. Okay, not a bad deal. Um, and much of that income is sheltered by depreciation and interest. So now there are some other projects that more on the 6.5% the range that we also get some hopefully back-end participation when the projects sell. So that's what she's worrying right now is to decide which one she wants, more income or does she want some back-end opportunities. But that's one of the things that you can do with a Delaware Statutory Trust. It's really just a big bucket that we can put assets into 
And some people call it mailbox money. All you have to do is just go to your mailbox, open it up. If anybody still has a mailbox, anybody still have a mailbox? Go open it up, and wouldn't it be wonderful if every month you found a check for $65,000? Okay, you know. Um, so that's uh, also if you have, depending on the size of the project, we can actually just do it just for you, your own individual project, not multiple with others. And for example, again, back to this one, while this uh, project here, I, I really happen to like this one, it's a whole group of doctors, independent doctors employed by a hospital that are um, leasing this entire building. So not a bad place, I think. We're, with healthcare in America, probably those doctors will be put to work for a long time, and therefore income streams are good. Okay, so that's idea number one. They're very simple, mailbox money, Delaware Statutory Trust, and using that in conjunction with a 1031. So it's not instead of a 1031, it's using a 1031, but making it really easy. Okay, what's the next one? Well, this is one that you may not have heard of, and again, this is my name for it, so if you scratch your head on this one, this is also called a charitable remainder trust. But let me talk to you about this case. This is a client I met a few years ago. It was brought in by another advisor, a lovely couple. He was 70, she was 65 at the time. They had bought this triplex up in Los Angeles, and um, they depreciated it because they held it for a very long time. So they really weren't getting any more depreciation. Not uncommon. As Lori McKinney will say, yeah, we, got, we were just talking about one of the projects. If you're looking to do some real estate investments, McKinney Capital is a great place to go talk to. Um, we just got one of our checks recently. Thank you very much. My, my checkbook is smiling. Uh, but there was very little to depreciate less on, on this building. And so the, the fair market value as we're sitting there was a little bit over $2 million. So I asked him, well, how much are you getting an income off, you know, off the project in your own net after property taxes and insurance and everything else? So he whipped his calculator out and you know, kind of looked at it again and this calculator again. He goes, hmm, we're getting 52,000, but as a percentage of 2 million, that's not very much, is it? Because what was he thinking before? He was remembering what he bought it for, not what it was worth. And after that, and then I asked the wife, I said, well, so if your husband, God forbid, was hit by a Mack truck, um, Mr. Ulaf, uh, you love dirt and I love dirt. Um, so I was asking I love, uh, what happens if you love gets hit by a Mack truck? She goes, I don't want this thing. So the question was, what do you do? If you don't want it, and you're really not getting much in the way of income off of this, are there some other alternatives? But they decided they did not want to do a 1031 exchange. So what could they do instead? So I found that they were philanthropic. They were involved. His, his mother was philanthropic as well, had a charity. So we suggested this. When we looked at the costs, if they were to sell the asset outright, they'd have about $100,000 in settlement costs. Commissions, which our real estate professionals earn every dime of it, but other costs of settlement as well. So about $100,000 on this project. In addition, they would pay almost three quarters of a million dollars in taxes of involuntary philanthropy. And then in addition to that, as we just said a moment ago, 1031 for them just really wasn't an option, despite these heavy expenses. So what else could they do? So that's why I suggested perhaps a capital gains alternative trust might be for their consideration. Now, what would that do for them? Well, first of all, it completely eliminates the taxes on the sale. It doesn't just postpone it, completely eliminates it. Now, why? We'll unpack that in a second. But zero taxes. The thing that happens is that we structured this in such a way that their income stream would be 6% a year. And could we earn more than that? Absolutely. Again, no guarantees. <laughs> so as an independent registered investment advisor, I'm not going to give you a guarantee on our rates of return. But Cheryl reminded me of that before we started. <laughs> and my compliance attorney, thanks you very much for that. But um, the point of the story here is, we structure it in such a way that we probably will be able to earn more than 6%, but we'll pay out 6 Anything that's left in the bucket just grows there. There's no tax on it. So even just at 6%, though, remember what they were making at that point if we, before? How much was that? 52000 So we more than doubled their income stream. But on top of that, guess what? Created an over a $600,000 income tax deduction. Wait a minute. Seismic. What, what, how did we do that? over a $600,000 income tax deduction. What was going on there? So 
and just some caveats, there are some limits and some governors in terms of how much tax deduction you can use. We can't use it all in one year in most cases. There's a cap, in this case, of 30% of the adjusted gross income, or now called MAGI, modified adjusted gross income. But the point is, we still get six years to use it up. So in most cases, we can get create tax deductions and then spread it over time. And the reason for that is because even though all these good things are happening, in addition to creditor protection, I was um, met a gentleman, I got brought in on a case a few years ago, and unfortunately he had bought in with leveraged real estate back in the 90s, and we had $10 million left after the sale of his company. He put a million in a capital gains alternative trust and put nine million in, in real estate. At that time, um, things kind of went south, and he lost all nine million dollars of the real estate because he was too heavily leveraged and he couldn't recover. The only thing he had left was the million dollars that was in the capital gains alternative trust, and the creditors couldn't get at that. So there are some times where having that creditor protected money is a really good idea. Also, you can buy more real estate, even though you're selling it, you can buy more as long as you're buying for cash. So, but why are all these goodies happening in this transaction? No tax. Income stream that is taxable, but an income stream that's significant. Protection from creditors, why is all this happening? Because eventually, when the kids, sorry, when the, when the parents are gone, whatever's left in the bucket is gonna go down to charity. Now, it could be their own family charity. It could be their own, what we call a family giving, what I like to call a family giving bucket or family giving account. So that's why by integrating philanthropy along with some of the traditional planning tools, we can do a much better job of both eliminating taxes because of what we're doing is we're eliminating the involuntary philanthropy by supporting the things that are in alignment with our own value system. Does that make sense? Now, how many people would rather have that than paying three quarters of a million dollars of involuntary philanthropy? And for those that, who have kiddos that say, um, yeah, but what about us? Because that does happen times. Uh, I've actually had situations where the next generation are objecting to the idea simply because they're not saying it, but they're going, hey, um, that money's going to charity, but what about us? So we can buy life insurance because now we have a significant amount of income tax deduction. We also have a significantly increased income stream, so we can just peel off a little bit, go buy life insurance, put it in an asset replacement trust, and, more, and give them actually even more than they would have received had they inherited the property outright. So everybody wins. Alrighty, so that's idea number two. Number two, the capital gains alternative trust. How many people like that one? Okay. So now let me tell you about in our last few minutes. Um, the we're getting real close. Um, I'm going to need probably to go over by about till 105. Is that okay? Does anybody need to leave before then? In which case, we'll see you by. But okay, thanks. But I think you're going to really want to hear this one. So I call it the tax deferred installment sale. And I was speaking on a, on a platform a couple years ago with another dear friend of mine. And I was the front speaker, and, he, and afterwards when I heard Randy finish his presentation, I said, Randy, tell me about this idea. This is terrific. I mean, it, again, it doesn't eliminate the tax, but putting off for 30 years to have to pay it, that's a sweet story. He said, RJ, it's like having an installment sale and a commercial loan, and they get together and have a baby. I said, okay, I don't understand that, but I'm intrigued, so tell me more. So before I do, <laughs> my compliance attorneys do want me to let you know that you need to seek your own independent counsel to review this idea, okay? So back me up if my, uh, I, if my attorneys come back and ask you, so you know, vouch for me, will you? But so anybody, I'm a kid from the Northwest, from a little city called y Yakima, Central Washington State. And anybody ever heard of a company called Boise Cascade? Okay, good, I'm not the only one. So um, how many people have heard of Office Depot? And Office Max. Okay, great. Well, that's actually a sale that happened a number of years ago. Office Depot bought Boise Cascade. It was a multi-billion dollar sale, 1.5 billion, and they paid no tax on the sale. How come? Because a Harvard-trained attorney then read about this idea and said, you know what? What they're doing with the Boise Cascade sale will work for one of my clients but not only will it work for one of my clients, but he said, I think we could do this. We could really make a lot of hay on this idea because nobody's doing this in the private transaction market. It's been done for decades in the publicly traded corporate market. In fact, the largest one I've seen so far is a 4.5 billion, with a B, $4.5 billion sale and tax deferral. Now, why that happens, I'll show you in a minute. But 
he then began reviewing that sale, used it for his client, and as they opened up a whole new industry. His name is Stan Crow, S. Crow Collateral Corporation up in Boise, Idaho. So um, there's no tax because we end up using an independent corporate lender. So here's the question. How many people have ever borrowed money to buy a house? Probably every hand in the room. Did you have to pay tax on that money that you borrowed? Did you have to report it as taxable income? No. Why? Because it was a debt that was collateralized by an asset, right? Okay. Now that's an example of, and David could tell us, being the champion maker that he is, that is an example of what's called recourse lending. In other words, where if you don't make your monthly payments, guess what? There's going to be a knock at the door, despite how friendly the people are at Bank of Southern California, there will be a knock at the door at some point saying, please pay your mortgage payments. If you don't, we'll take the house back. They don't want to do that, by the way. So, but anyway, um, you don't want that to happen either. So here's the thing, though. What makes this different is this is a non-recourse or limited recourse loan, where if you don't pay, that's OK. So let me walk you through this. So we, we now have a case, as I mentioned, where a client is selling a lot of dirt, uh, a farmland, in El Centro. And so the buyer is going to sell to the buyer, just as determined before. But now we're going to put somebody in between. We're going to put in what's called an intermediary. So that's why a 1031 exchange works, because you have somebody in between that takes the money and holds the money. Now, in that case, they don't hold it for longer than six months. In this case, that intermediary is going to hold the, phone, the, hold the funds for 30 years. Why 30 years? Simply because there's, what they do is they take that money, they put it in the stock market, and there's no time in the U.S. history where the U.S. stock market has never been positive over a 30-year period of time. It's always been positive. There were some decades where it's been a little troublesome, but not over 30 years. So they're, in, they're investing that money for 30 years. They're the intermediary. And they're, on the basis of that, the lenders, there are, there are lenders out there that say, hmm, since you, the intermediary, have the proceeds of the sale, we'll make a loan to the seller of 95% of the proceeds. The intermediary is holding the funds. It's absolutely guaranteed that that loan is going to be repaid. So they charge an interest rate that's much lower than they would have because they didn't have to find the business. The business found them. And it's absolutely riskless. There's no risk of default. So at the end of 30 years, the sale is then reported, and that's when the tax is paid. So how many people, if you had your choice between paying a tax now or paying a tax in 30 years, how many people would choose paying the 30 years? Show of hands. OK. The rest of you, I know you are now, uh, you had tryptophan in your turkey sandwich, and you were asleep. Because all of us should be saying, I'm going to pay my tax in 30 years, you bet. There are limits. No more. This is $5 million per person, but a husband and wife, that's $10 million. Husband and wife and two kids, that's $20 million. If, it, if the sale gain is, and this is gain, if the sale gain is above the $5 million per person, we can still have an unlimited amount. We just have to pay some interest on the portion above $5 million. Um, so again, 95% of the net sales proceeds on a limited recourse basis, which means that the intermediary is the only person that has to make the payments. The person who gets the money, they don't worry about it. And in 30 years, they have to pay a tax. But here's the thing. Let's say the tax is a million dollars. And what's the rule of 72? Money doubles at 7.2% in how many years? 10 years, right? So money doubles in 10 years. So if I owed a tax of a million dollars, and I didn't pay it for 30 years, so at the end of 10 years, my million dollars would now be worth how much? Two million. At the end of another 10 years, my two million is worth? Four million. At the end of another 10 years, my four million is worth eight million. So I don't care if the tax rates are 100% in 30 years. My million dollars of tax that I would have paid is now worth eight million dollars. Guess what? There's more than enough to pay the tax and also have a very handsome return. Okay? Plus, my client, bless his heart, we've been, he's, he's, he's RJ, I'm a farmer. Keep it simple for me. So we probably went over this one question maybe 20 times. So let me get this straight, RJ. I can use this cash for anything. I can take my wife and we can go on a really nice trip. Yeah, you can. You just can't deduct any interest charge. But yes, that's right. You can um, buy more real estate. You can buy more farm equipment. You can do whatever the heck you want to do with the cash. 
And for you real estate agents out there, you want to know that they can take that money and go buy more real estate with it. And now you women, I know you know how to get bargains. My wife, somebody says, oh, that, Vimian, that looks beautiful on you. She goes, yeah, and I got it 30% off, right? <laughs> Isn't that what you women do? It's always, okay, thanks very much. I got it for, yeah, okay. Us, but even us guys, even me, I could negotiate a pretty good buy if I just have cash that I'm walking in to buy a new asset with. And not only that, but they also get a brand new depreciation. So the basis on an asset, if you're 1031 in an asset, you're carrying over the depreciated basis, which means you probably don't get to take more depreciation. But with cash, you go out and buy a new asset, and guess what? You get a brand new depreciation to work with. Okay, good stuff. So there you have it. Of what I call the easy 1031. <laughs> and then uh, remember, that's the good DST, the good HDL, right? Um, for, and then capital gains alternative trust, and then also the tax deferred installment sale. So let's make taxes voluntary instead of the involuntary and support the social well being of our country in a way that's more in alignment with your own value system instead of letting them choose. And what's, what's really exciting, and I mean this in all sincerity, is that that's, the government lets us do that. That's part of the 1969 Tax Act. That's what it was there for, is to enable us to go ahead and make an impact in our world and in our community in a lasting, positive way. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here with us, and I want to thank our speakers. Tim, really, as always, your champ. Cheryl, you're extraordinary to work with. Um, Carl DeMaio, thank you for what he's doing. And at Wealth Legacy Group, um, the reason for the name <clears throat> is because we deal with all things of wealth, and investment and, and helping clients with their businesses, but it's all about legacy as well. And every day, every one of us has the choice in terms of the legacy that we're leaving. So it doesn't matter how badly I screwed up yesterday or whatever I did, and I don't think I did anything bad, too best. I don't, didn't honk at anybody, at least on the freeway, or do anything unpleasant. But um, you know what? We all make some choices that we wish we could undo. Well, guess what? God gives us a fresh new day today to, in fact, impact our world in some way. So one of my favorite quotes, and I'll leave with this, um, uh, Coach um, Wooden from UCLA. How many people have heard of that name, John Wooden? He said, you've never lived a perfect day until you have done something for someone else who can't repay you, So with, who cannot repay you. So I would encourage each of you to find some way today to just do something nice for somebody who can't repay you, even if it's paying a toll or buying an ice cream or just doing something, opening the door for someone, just being kind and just making a difference in some lasting positive way. And um, thank you with that. I want to thank you all for coming and joining us and spending your valuable time with us. So God bless. Go out and leave a legacy.